Um, and we've been, in some sense, I mean, this is a little bit silly, this equation, but this is kind of the direction we've been taken, taking, which is to take some of these transactional psychology ideas, combine them with the sociolog uh, sociology tradition of symbolic interactionism. So uh, Goffman's um, work on dramaturgical analysis it, it certainly you know, is, is kind of a canonical example, early example of symbolic interactionism, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that have been spawned from Goffman. So we sort of take uh, transactional psychology, a dose of symbolic interactionism, combine it with media, where we basically watch very closely things like Sex in the City or Mean Girls. And we have these little like ethnography parties where we'll queue up Mean Girls and then sit there and pause it all the time and try to, um, uh, to diagram basically every kind of psychological game we see the characters play with each other in the course of the, of the show using frameworks we borrowed from these people and that gives us our models of social games. Well, what the, our sort of operating hypothesis is that uh, the screenwriters for things like Sex in the City and Mean Girls um, they implicitly know all these social games. They might not be able to explicitly list them out, but what they have done is they, they sort of implicitly have catalogs of these, and they're taking the volume knob and turning it up to 11, right? That's, that's basically what uh, drama does as a medium, is takes the volume knob on those, uh, on those interpersonal interactions and turns them up to 11, which makes them really easy to see or general term social game in this work. Um, it's a pattern of multi-agent interactions whose function is to modify the social state existing within and across participants. And so in this model, um, uh, you know, you might have like three friends standing around in a hall and we, we kind of model the characters when they're playing these social games by, uh, uh, through this very kind of means ends analysis, right? Which is very AI, where one, one character might really have a goal to have another character like them better. And so they're going to figure out then, in my little repertoire of social games, what kind of social game can I make happen between the three of us that I think is likely to result in this person liking me a little more? You know, maybe it's going to be like a show, you know, show off a, a, cool, uh, a, 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 a cool thing I can do, right? Or maybe it'll be um, uh, purposely uh, uh, making fun of some person who's not even present that I know the person I want to like me more dislikes. Right? That uh, sounds like a pretty good move in this sort of social game space to achieve that. And so then um, we've kind of created these catalogs and the agents sort of reason uh, and perform these social games to explicitly manipulate social state. The AI architecture that enables this is called comme il faut, uh, which in, in French is basically, uh, uh, you know, doing it right, right? <laughs> it means sort of like, you know, do, do it right or do it correctly. And so the experimental game we're creating around comme il faut is currently the prom. Uh, and the prom is set in an American high school, uh, and it's sort of the social machinations of the goths and emos. The kind of gameplay we are enabling uh, using Comme il faut as sort of the, the under, underlying kind of operational logic is in a sense solving um, social puzzles. And the analogy we use is to um, physics-based puzzle games, where physics-based puzzle games like World of Goo um, use an underlying physics model to support emergent solutions to the puzzles, right? Unlike, say, traditional puzzles from, uh, uh, say, the graphical adventure game days of the mid-'80s, where the solution to the puzzle was explicitly scripted, and it's like, do A, B, and C, and you solve the puzzle, and the player's challenge is to figure out what A, B, and C the author specifically had in mind when they made the game. Unlike that, um, contemporary physics-based puzzle games use the underlying physics model to enable a space of potential and emergent solutions which players can discover on their own, right? And, and, it, and it's sort of a commonplace occurrence in those sort of games that um, players will discover solutions to the puzzles that, uh, that, that the author never knew you could do. Um, well, in a similar way, we want to enable social physics. Right? We want to have these sort of space of social games uh, create this kind of emergent potential space where we can set up a social puzzle, like um, get Edward and Karen to date. Boom, here's an initial condition. It's one of the little social puzzles that you have to try to solve on your way to the prom. Um, but there isn't one right solution in how to get Edward to Karen to date. And you have to sort of figure out how to navigate through this you know, complex potential space of social interactions to see if you can get Edward and Karen to date. Where every character um, needs to kind of figure out at a, at, at a kind of moment in time in the game, um, out of all the games they could play, 
and all the characters they could play the games with or involve in their games, which ones do they most want to play? The initiator is going to try to initiate a game with another character, but the other character doesn't have to accept it, right? The other character may reject the game and perform kind of an alternative version of the game that, say, backfires. The second box has to do sort of all the reasoning about when do I accept or reject a game, and that's a function of all kinds of complicated state involving social statuses, social traits, the current underlying uh, uh, social state variables, which in, in the prom are uh, your cool factor, sort of cool, romance, and buddy are the kind of three social networks that underlie uh, at the bottom the social state. And then on top of that, there can be all kinds of different statuses that occur, which like us, you know, statuses in any game um, are kind of temporary bits of social state that emerge uh, as functions of this lower level state. There's multiple potential outcomes of how you're actually going to play that game. You have to select among those. And then finally, the game has to actually be realized. Real dialogue has to be spoken, right? And facts need to be referred to from the past and so on. And that's the performance realization. Because again, one of our goals in this project was to take the social game idea from facade, which we felt was pretty powerful, but make it so that more of the detailed writing of the character interactions was done by the system. So what are some factors about why she might want to play the breakup game? So some act has happened in the past, and this, this is one of the things that's important, is the system actually has to support maintaining an episodic memory of all the previous social interactions. Because in a sense, every previous social game that's been played, the facts that were brought up and the state that resulted are kind of raw fodder, raw material for future social games. Right? So this cheating thing would actually be kind of a side effect of some previous social game that's played. But if we're storing that away in some database, future games can use it. And so then you get this sort of uh, compounding complexity, which is, is a factor of social life. Uh, then we have to sort of choose an outcome. And outcomes get chosen, again, kind of as a function of social state, of social statuses. You might... Uh, uh, realize Facebook resolution, right? So we're planning on releasing this on Facebook, uh, kind of a natural play to make in this day and age. Um, uh, but you know, if we if we start clicking on some characters, you know, if I click on her, I see some traits: irritable, afraid of commitment, witty, sympathetic, and she also has some statuses. You know, if I, and if I look at these statuses, we see anxious and jealous of caring, right? Uh, and then we look at Nelson here. So here's Nelson's the guy with the, uh, the Linux shirt. Um, and, uh, and, and the social puzzle here is you tr are trying to get Nelson going out with her, right? And if we sort of click on the two of them, we see um, there are some problems in the way. Uh, these, uh, these bars on the top are indicating uh, the, the buddy, romance, and cool network. The length of the bar going from uh, Nelson towards... Uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm totally blanking her name. This one's Karen. I'm, <laughs> I'm blanking her name. But anyways, uh, going from Nelson towards her, you can see his are all really long. He likes her. He feels very romantic and inclined to her. She thinks she's really, she's really cool. Hers towards him are really short. She doesn't think much of him. And so in fact, if we try to go for the direct, you know, the direct path here, physically flirt, um, we will discover, uh, you know, word, fair Maeve, my, you're looking ravishing today. You know, WTF, did you just touch my ear? Weirdo. And then this is some debug text. Reject, romance network between responder and initiator, minus 20. Oh, all right, so obviously that wouldn't be there, uh, the, uh, the debug text. Um, but that's, um, and so now, in fact, if we look, uh, romance between the two of them, uh, hers towards him is even lower. So you might suspect that, oh, I'm going to need to try to figure out how to break them up to make her more likely to accept an Ask Out game, but then who could I use? Well, there's this person over here, and she actually really likes Nelson. And so then you start getting into these social machinations where, well, can Nelson convince her to say something to him that she might perceive as cheating, which would cause her to initiate a breakup with him, leaving her more open to accept his advances? This is the kind of gameplay uh, Common Foe uh, uh, supports. This particular uh, social situation is actually tuned really hard. Like, I have, I have trouble um, solving this one, and it is possible to get it into sort of an unsolvable state where you get Nelson's just so in the hole, basically, that there's nothing he's going to do to ever get. Uh, uh, and in fact, we're sort of intending that you don't 
don't have to accomplish every puzzle for the game to advance towards the prom, um, and that sort of final outcomes during the prom are going to be influenced by which ones you you know did and didn't successfully solve and so forth. Once you have um, uh, uh, a system for sort of doing this kind of social game-based reasoning um, under, the, under the hood. You could imagine applying this to many games in which you want social interaction to be primary. So to some degree, this is what we're trying to do with the prom, um, is have a set of, uh, instead of modeling characters, we're modeling in a sort of character neutral way, social games, and then you plug in characters and as a function of things like the traits on the characters, their statuses, basically uh, data-driven information that you include on the characters, the system figures out how, how, how to have the characters play the game. Just like game engines actually solidify specific operational logics, so, so would a character engine. So in other words, the people doing uh, people who are trying to radically innovate will always end up having to roll their own because rolling your own is actually the work involved in enabling a new operational logic. But if you're, but if you're wanting to use, say, prom-like social game interaction in a game where you're trying to innovate in other dimensions, right? It's just like, I want characters who know how to play social games um, and then on top of that, I'm going to do some new you know, thing that you want to experiment with, then yes, I believe you could use, I mean, we hope that people would use, say, Comilfo for that. But in the same way that, you know, like, you know, all Flash games tend to look like Flash games. I mean, you look at a game for like three seconds, ah, they made it in Flash. Or, um, you know, uh, Unreal Tournament, you know, those of you who have tried to do total conversion mods in Un Unreal Tournament, it's amazing the amount of work you have to do to get the gun out of their hands, right? So I've tried to actually use Unreal Tournament to, uh, I've hooked Able up to Unreal Tournament in the past and sort of gave up that line of work. This was circa 2003, 2004, where I wanted a, a, a sort of game engine, Able plus a game engine for doing social simulation. Um, and it turned out Unreal Tournament, you know, it, it, you know, it pretends, at, at first thought you might mean, you think it's a generic you know, game engine or generic, it, there's nothing generic about it. It's basically everything about it is encapsulating in a sort of hard way, in a hard to change way, the dynamics of a first person shooter. And if you're trying to do anything other than a first person shooter in it, you do a lot of work, right? And that's, and, and in fact, in the game art movement, people who, you know, it, it, that can be part of the aesthetics of some forms of game art that use game engines, is to use like a first-person shooter engine and do something really different than a first-person shooter in it. And that's kind of a way of showing off a certain kind of talent or skill, right? Because people in the know will know like, oh, you made Unreal Tournament do that. I know how much work it would be to do the total conversion mod to try to do that, right? But, it, but in a sense, that kind of like proves the point that these, none of these engines are neutral. And so, you know, it's going to be the same thing for character engines. And I don't think there'll be like one character engine. There'll be lots of different kinds of character simulations available. But I completely agree with you that, that, that there will be this family of them and you'll be able to plug them in. Like in, until we start um, encapsulating uh, the kind of design lessons and logics learned in some of this AI research into kind of reusable engines of that form, then very few people will be building these games. Another part of uh, the Comel Four project that I didn't uh, show is the rather complicated authoring tool that we've developed. So over time, we've actually developed a you know this like you know sort of crazy you know kind of like in industry scale complexity authoring tool for authoring social games, for authoring performance realizations, and so on. We've put you know there's like eight or nine people who have worked just on the tool. Um, but the reason we did that is because eventually we do want to, besides releasing the prom, release Comel Four plus the tool, and again. And you actually have to have the the authoring story in place as well if you want other people to use uh, to use your your new approach. It, as far as something you can download right now is in Form Seven for making uh, interactive fictions, text-based interactive fictions. And Form Seven actually comes sort of preloaded with a bunch of logic about sort of the common sense physics of the everyday world. You know, containers contain objects. You can only get at the contained object when they're open. Um, uh, locked objects can't be opened when they're closed. Uh, dark spaces, you can't see anything until there's light. Sources of light behave in a certain way. All this stuff that's kind of part of the text adventure tradition and then the literary interactive fiction tradition. In Form 7 comes with all that stuff preloaded as basically knowledge that, you know, you can write a, you know, a piece of Inform 7 code like this long 
hit the run button and you've got a room you can move around in, objects you can pick up and down, they all behave correctly, tables behave correctly, all this. So that would be an example of, um, for sort of, I guess I would call it like common sense physics simulation. Kind of, it, you know, it's not it's not numerical physics simulation, but it's sort of like common sense symbolic physics simulation. Like they've already put that in the engine, and then you can, and then there are ways to overwrite it. But I, but I've actually used Inform Seven uh, uh, in the past in my own thinking as kind of an inspiration. Like the same way that Inform Seven does that for everyday physical interaction, we want to do that for social interaction. So it comes loaded with all these defaults. And just out of the bag, you have characters doing all this complicated stuff, and then you can overwrite it for your for your particular characters. Got it? Because um, people are so used to the lockstep kind of character interact. Like basically, in, in contemporary games, players have unfortunately gotten used to this strange dichotomy where, like, the combat will be some really interesting emergent rule system, and the and the interaction will be a, a, um, a dialogue tree. Right. <laughs> so, so the way to think about beats is they really are parameterizing a character simulation. The characters have internal goals and desires. They have emotions. They're trying to make things happen. But the player can interact with them while they're doing that. So, yes, they're responding to the player interaction, but they're not just standing around waiting to hear from the player. Like they've got their own agendas and they're pursuing things. And if you don't say anything, they'll go on. And if you don't say anything for a while, they'll say, player, why aren't you talking to us? What's wrong? And in fact, if you just stand there stock still for a while, they'll throw you out of the apartment for being a weirdo, right? And they would be, and so um, it, it, so I guess the way to think about it is um, in the same way, like in a platformer game, that every level, uh, there could be new rules for the level, right? Like a level might introduce ice. And so then there's rules about sliding and then, you know, and those rules hold for like five or 10 minutes. And then when you complete the level, the simulation gets reparameterized with a new level, and you play that. Think of the beats as like that, except we're choosing a new level every 45 seconds. So every 45 seconds, the, 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 the simulation, the underlying simulation, is being given new parameters and new goals that are for that beat, but it's still maintaining its dynamism. It's not like some hard-coded dialogue tree is, uh, is coming down or something. So I guess if you just think about it, um, just like game levels currently reparameterize the simulation, but they do it every five or 10 minutes. We're doing it every 45 seconds, and, and we call those units beats.